Take your Bibles out and turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. If you're joining us via Facebook Live, we apologize for not giving you more notice, but we are not going to have the musical portion of our services on Facebook Live due to audio issues and things. So, uh, for better or for worse, you're joining now. <laughs> but hopefully, not to hear the mere voice of a man, but to hear the voice of God. Amen? Amen. That's why we are here. James chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 18, and then we're going to read through the end of the chapter. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Amen. If you think about your life, there is so much information that is passing through that brain of yours on a consistent basis that has no impact on how you live your life. It is mere empty information that's like empty calories for the brain. Remember being in school and thinking to yourself during some classes, when in the world am I ever going to need this information? And then you would pursue that and then discover that every adult confirmed, indeed, you would never need that information. But multiple times, how does it translate into life? But then you get out of school and you continue to take in more information. And then you begin to peruse different things and click on different things and read different things and Wikipedia yourself to death with useless facts and information that change nothing. And what you've done is you are training your mind that there's so much information that makes zero impact on how you live your life. Here's the danger of that. We then come to this book having trained our mind that we can take in a lot of information that makes no impact, and then we begin to read this book. And what does our minds do? Here's more information that makes no impact on how we live our lives. Here's more words, more knowledge, more things that instruct us that, frankly, how does it change me? How does it impact anything we do, anything I say, any place I go? The Bible is a book that is not meant to merely be full of information. It's not Wikipedia for the soul just for us to, in an academic way, think through what it says. Because James would swoop in and say, no, 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 if James was living today. The Word of God is everything in life. It is meant to impact you in every way. It is not only meant to give you birth spiritually, but it's also meant to transform your life spiritually. And the section I just read is where the writer goes in with what he calls the word of truth. The word of truth in verse 18. James in this section says, oh, we've got to unpack because if you're going to be a Christ follower, you have to be one who not only studies the word, but seeks to apply it. Says there is not knowledge in here that is merely for knowledge's sake. It is knowledge for transformational sake. But look in verse 18, he calls it the word of truth. 
In verse 21, it is called the implanted word. In verse 22, it's called the word. In verse 23, it's called the word. In verse 25, it's called the perfect law, the law of liberty. In chapter 2, he calls it again the law of liberty and also the royal law. James has a firm conviction as he is writing, and that is the scriptures he's referring to is authoritative, and therefore you not only need to hear it into those ears of yours, but it also needs to be brought in that you do it, you heed it, you do what it says. I mean, could you imagine you go to engineering school, which would have been a complete joke for me had I done that. My brother and my father could do that. I could not. But go through engineering school, and then you get out of the school, quote, become an engineer, and you do nothing that an engineer does. Like, that doesn't matter. Can you imagine going through medical school? Go through medical school, learn anatomy, learn everything that you're supposed to learn, then you go through your rotations, and then you're finally done with everything. You do nothing that a doctor does. What's the information supposed to do? It changes how you live out that occupation. Why do we think someone can be a Christian and continually not do what the Bible says? That would be as ridiculous as any other occupation that they go through and get trained, and then they never do. Not because they switch occupations. You know what I mean, people, right? But they're actually in the occupation, but they keep rejecting everything the occupation says you're supposed to do in that occupation. And yet in Christianity, we're content with just growing a knowledge of Scripture that has no transformational power. That, wow, we're to actually do what God says if we say, I am a Christian. It should be unacceptable to any of us to call ourselves a Christian, and yet we don't do what God says to do. It certainly would have been unacceptable to James. James is addressing all of us as to our interaction with the Word of God. If indeed we've received the new birth of verse 18, he brought us forth by the Word of truth, then how is our ongoing interaction with the Word of God going on in our lives. If we've been born again, John 3, or 1 Peter 1, if we're born again, then how is our affection, how is our interaction with the Word of God? Because the, the Word of God that gives you birth is the same Word of God that gives you new life in light of the new birth. So how do we, how do we interact with it? Well, that's what James wants to address. And I just want to say up front, I really tried, I really tried to do all these verses in one sermon. So relax, we're not getting through this whole outline. So there, you, that way you don't have to look at it and go, my, he's not even to the back yet. We won't get to the back side. We're only going to be on the front side of your notes. So you can relax. Number one, but it doesn't mean James still isn't going to kick us around a little. Number one, hear God's word patiently. Hear God's word patiently. Look at verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Hear God's word patiently. The old nature of verses 14 and 15, do you remember that nature? As we spoke of, each person is tempted, Lord. That old nature is in conflict with the new nature of verse 18. James is speaking here of this of this conflict that is happening. So God was kind enough to birth a new nature within us, and the new nature within finds a companion in the word of God, in the word of truth. Because that word of truth that birthed us is the same one that is going to grow us. But he commands us that we have to hear it. We have to hear it. Now, James, don't be upset with him. He is non-discriminatory, isn't he? Know this, my beloved brothers. Let all of those who are not in leadership be quick to hear. Let all those who are not Bible teachers be quick to hear. Let all those who are younger be quick to hear. What does he say there? Let who? Everyone, every person, all of us, whether old, young, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, all of us are to be quick to hear. Quick to hear. No one is excluded. To be quick to hear, it means to make it a priority in our lives. There's an eagerness that comes with it. Like you're sitting on the edge of your seat because you're excited to, to see something or be engaged in something. It's like a child on Christmas morning or Christmas Eve or whenever you do that, that they're excited to go open a present. 
There's an eagerness in it. It's like a mom who gets to hold her baby for the first time. There's an eagerness in her heart and anticipation. Or for you grandparents, the first time you get to meet a grandson or granddaughter. How exciting that is. There's an eagerness that you must be quick to hear. That there's an anticipation in it, in our hearts. Indeed, many of us come some by sun, Sunday by Sunday and hear a sermon, meaning the sound waves go out and they pass through that ear canal of yours and enter into your mind. But what is the condition of the heart that receives those sound waves? What is the condition of your spirit? Are you eager to hear? Are you coming and say, Lord, speak to me? I want to hear from you. I want to hear your voice. And let me be clear, this is no secondary matter. This isn't, well, this is just one line. And James, what's the big deal? Because I think James understood what his brother had to say. Jesus said in Luke 8, 18, take care then how you hear. Jesus speaking, take care. Luke 8, 8, take care then how you hear For the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. Take care how you listen. Take care. Because God is keeping track of all the information that you receive and going, my child, what are you doing with that? And Mark 4, 24, and he said to them, this is Jesus, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. Pay careful attention. How often we're just so concerned about the sins of our culture, the sins of our day, but yet one of the greatest sins is not paying in careful attention to how we listen to the Word of God, the voice of God. We're so easily distracted by the superfluous and the mundane of life. We get alone with God's word, but it's always God's word and my phone. Mm, reading. Oh, I'll just respond real quick to this. Okay. Reading. Oh, wait, there's a news alert. Oh, President Bush died. Oh, man. Can't believe that. Pray for the Bush family. Okay, let me read. Oh, wait, look what's happening here. This is our life. It's like God has to make an appointment with you. And even then, he doesn't get your solitary time because we're staring at these things. I mean, what a brilliant idea by the devil to say, okay, if I can't get you to stop reading your Bible, I'll get you so distracted while you read it that it really makes no impact on you at all. I was, as I was singing this, I thought, I remember a guy when I went through training, there was a guy named John Gullickson, and John was a junior staff member on President, uh, in the White House with President Reagan. I remember John telling me this story. He said, I was walking through the White House and I had a stack of papers and I walk right around the corner and there's President Reagan. Like, wow, there's President Reagan. I remember John's young, he's in his 20s and, and President Reagan goes, John, are, are you busy? <laughs> what are you gonna say if the leader of the United States of America says, are you busy? What's the answer? <laughs> no, thank you, just want, in case you have that moment, you're not busy. No, he goes, well, come on in here. So he went into, I don't know what room it was, one room with a fireplace. They sat on the couch. He poured them a glass of cognac, and they sat down for an hour and talked about life for an hour. No one else in the room, John and President Reagan. Is that a cool moment? Could you imagine if he was sitting there going, excuse me, sir, I got to respond to this text. That you, what? What? Right? Wouldn't you be, you'd go slap them around. Cannot God, the author of your life, can he not have time alone with you? Can he not have the moment that you come and worship once a week where you're not staring at this guy? Can it not be a time when you turn it off? Well, I need to know what time it is. No, you don't. There's enough of you out there keeping track of time to get on me if I go long. Cannot God have your heart for moments rather than him getting piecemeals of time and, and, and so distracted? Know this, my book. Let every person be quick to hear. And to me, that means undistracted. See, this is the cultivation of the heart. Because 
there can't be a switch because you... In this section, these verses, there's debate amongst scholars. Is he referring just to the Word of God of verse 18, meaning let each person be quick to hear, or is he speaking in life as a person, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger? So there's debate amongst this. And certainly, I think near is the Word of God. But I think secondarily, our hearts aren't a switch you can flip on and off. If I'm a person who hears intently with the word, you know where that's going to transfer my life? As I engage with people. I'm going to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So if I'm doing it in regards to the word of God, it's going to transfer then into my personal relationships with people. I'm not going to be one who's so boisterous out here and cutting everybody off, and then I come in and I'm really obeying James 1.19 faithfully. No, it's, it's where our hearts, it's the cultivation of our heart. Are we a person who is quick to hear regardless as to where we are? Quick to hear and slow to speak. Because if we have a heart that's quick to hear, it's beyond just the word of God. It's also listening to other people. But secondly, you see what he says, not just quick to hear, that we are to be slow to speak. Slow to speak. Boy, our society has turned this whole verse on its head, hasn't it? We have it completely be, be slow to hear, quick to speak, quick to anger. That's the mantra of our society is exactly that. We commend one another for speaking quick. Oh, that's a person who just speaks their mind. And we commend it. And God said in heaven going, no, no, I don't want you to do that to be quick to hear, slow to speak. Many of us are so intoxicated with our own verbosity that we just love hearing ourselves, just get people, hey, let me talk some more. But that is contrary to what the Bible teaches. Proverbs 10, you can look these up later. They're not going to be on the screen. But Proverbs 10, 19, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. (laughs) Some of us need that just like mantra everywhere. If you could tattoo it on the inside of your eyelids, that would be, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. Hey, I have no one in mind right now. I'm just general population. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Proverbs 17, 27, whoever restrains his words has knowledge. Isn't that great? I mean, right there, you have like a PhD. If you restrain your words, you have knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Proverbs 21, 23, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. In the Hebrew, it says, if you keep yourself shut up, you keep yourself from getting beat up. That's what it says in the Hebrew, that we make it a little, you know, that's my fluent Hebrew coming out. Any guy who's been a police officer in this room knows that. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Oh, man. So there's a lot of stories. Go ask him. Proverbs 29, 20. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. If you're hasty in words, the Bible says you are worse than a fool. You're like a double fool, a fool squared. If you're hasty in words. The rabbis had a saying, the Jewish rabbis, it went something like this. Men have two ears but one tongue that they should hear more than they speak. The ears are always open, ever ready to receive instruction, but the tongue is surrounded with a double row of teeth to hedge it in and keep it within proper bounds. Think of that right there. Even if you have false teeth, eh, you're still putting them in to keep that tongue. That's how we, and is James going to have more to say about the tongue? Oh, yeah. We've only just begun with the tongue. Because when people begin to speak, what are they most often speaking about? The Trinity. Me, myself, and I. We love talking about me. It's like the Toby Keith song, that I want to I talk about me. That Some of you are like, Toby Keith, who's that? The country, I want to talk about me. I want to talk about, because he's with someone who's always talking about themselves. He's like, we're always talking about you. Or as the, Brian, the comedian Brian Regan says, beware the me monster. Oh, the me monster. Oh, and I was did this and I did that. Or if you're telling a story, someone who comes in with a story topper. 
right? You've been around people. In fact, you've done it. Someone says, hey, this happened to me. You're like, oh, that's nothing. <laughs> okay, sorry, that's nothing. Just what I went through. Let me tell you what I went through. Ah. And then we stop one another. That's not being slow to speak. It's like when you're in a conversation, and so you can't wait till their lips stop moving. I got something to say. Stop. Stop. I'm on here. And you get on them. That's what we do. People speak and they speak, and we're not listening. Our ears are closed. We're already formulating what we're going to say. And right when they're done, I mean, the, the sound waves have barely gotten in our ear. We're, we're in with that. And James is like, oi, vey. He would have said, oi, vey, because he's Jewish. Oi, vey. You, you're speaking about yourself, you're all over each other. Where is that honoring to the Lord at all? If we've done something praiseworthy, then who should get the praise? God. Let another praise you and not your own lips. Oh, to guard ourselves as Scripture, what credit should we give one another? If there is anything good I have ever done, who gets credit for that? The Lord. What credit do I get? All the bad stuff I've done. You can give that to me. I did that. It's such a continual temptation, but to talk about who we are and what we've done and what we possess, but a true heart that has been birthed by the word of truth realizes, wait, it's not about me, for I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So to be slow to speak is to be slow to certainly speak about myself but I would add one more, actually several more. Be slow to speak about others. Be slow to speak about others. Because as soon as you begin to speak about someone else in a negative light, you've judged yourself the opposite of what they are. Boy, he's such a covetous person. Meaning what? I'm not. Wow, they're they're such a brash person, and, and I'm not. You see, whenever you begin to criticize, by implication or inference, you're saying, I'm not that. And James is going to have more to say about that in James 4 with judging one another. But that we're so quick to not hear, but then speak so quickly and think, I got something to add. We have so very little to add. But I would say also specifically, as he's going to address in James 3, not many of you should become teachers. Be slow to speak for God. Be slow to speak for God. Oh, my. Well, this is what I think God is like or what God is doing or what God has done. or This is what I think that this verse means without having studied it. Oh, man, go to seminary. <laughs> I thought I knew something before I got to seminary. And, oh, yeah, this is what this verse means. And, like, have you really studied it? Mm, no. And then I've come to find out it would mean just the opposite <laughs> of what I thought which is why I think he is saying, be slow to speak for God and for his word. Be very careful lest you stand up and say something that is not what God is saying. Oh, my. Oh, my. That's why he says in chapter 3, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we are who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Be slow to speak. And finally, be slow to anger. Let's move on because we all don't have any issues with anger. So let's go on with the rest. It's no secondary topic in Scripture, is it? Anger. The first sin after Genesis 3 is what? The sin of anger, which leads to murder. How many, I was thinking of this as I was studying, how many men or women are sitting in prison for the rest of their lives because an uncontrolled angry moment? changed everything. Anger. Be slow to anger. Be slow. So is he saying never be angry? Does he say that? No, he doesn't say that. Is there a place for righteous indignation? Yes, but that's probably 1% of your anger issue is righteous indignation. The rest of it is not that. Now, psychologists will, will sometimes claim that emotions 
since they are a natural product of the personality, cannot truly be controlled. Or that anger could only be suppressed or ignored. But James's exhortation presumes differently. Emotions are the product of the entire person. And by God's grace and by the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, we can be transformed so that our emotions come in line with God's will, that our emotions come alongside with God's heart. That is possible. So don't say to yourself, those of you who have minors in psychology or major, we are unable to control our anger. Yes, we are. Otherwise, God would have never commanded us to do so. Because, and think about the whole context of James thus far. What did he begin with? Count it all joy when you encounter various, what? Trials. So trials are going to come, various kinds. So a trial comes, arrives on your doorstep. Hi, I'm your trial. So what do we do generally when a trial begins? We get angry. Anger greets the trial. What does James say to greet the trial with? Hey, welcome. Glad you're here. Come on in. (laughs) We're going to be hanging out for a little bit because you want to teach me some things about God. Yes, I do. Well, I'm glad you're here. So it's not anger that should be the response to trials. Be slow to anger. And what happens when anger comes? What shuts up and opens up? Anger arrives. What happens to our ears? La, 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 la. And what happens to our mouth? So mouth moves, ears stop, anger rises. It's a symbiotic relationship. They correlate together. As, and you can feel the anger, right? You can, some of us can't. All you judgmental looking at me, hey, you feel it. Something happens and you can feel it beginning to rise. And if you don't grab it right then, confess. If you're sitting with someone, oh, I've tried, my wife just, but actually we had an elder discussion on the way our wives can tell. Even if we think we're keeping our anger or our disappointment or our frustration under the cover, it's, one guy said, my eyebrow moves. You're busted. I don't, I still don't know what I do, but Rachel would just look and go, I can tell. Like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, no, really, I'm fine. No, you're not. Because as Cain with Abel, it says when Cain got angry, his countenance fell. When anger arises in the heart, God has made us so outwardly it is evident. Trust the people around you that know you well. When your spouse says, I can see it, see what? It's not there. Yes, it is. That's our flesh beginning to take control of it. And, and James is saying that the word of God has to be there to take that anger and to change it from the anger of the flesh in order to get to the righteousness of God. Anger is birthed out of our sinful hearts. You know, you know what your heart contains? Self-importance, self-assertion, intolerance, and t- stubbornness. So it's Christmas time. Yay! I'm going to go to the store and buy a couple presents. Boo! <laughs> what are the lines like? But we walk into the store like everybody should have been there waiting on me to arrive. I'm here now. Everything I want should be on the shelf, and all of you people need to get out of my way. We're full of our own self-importance. We get up to the line. Why are all these people in line here? Well, why are you here adding to the mix of the people? I mean, that's our own self-importance. Rather than walking in and going, wow, I get to hang out with people I don't know. Lord, why not have me begin a conversation with someone in line? Lord, why not make that a redemptive, patient moment rather than anger arising and what is a trial is something that God could use in our lives. Well, Lord, you brought me here. I was the one who didn't order it online like my wife told me to. I came to the store, and so now here I am. And so the anger needs to be replaced because, verse 24, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. What a convicting verse. How many times have I thought that 
the goal is to get someone to stop doing something. You need to stop doing that. Whatever that's going to do, stop it. And then they stop it. So how's the relationship now? (laughs) Oh, yeah, they may have stopped doing that, but you've also put a big breach in the relationship because of how you treated someone with anger. Be slow to anger. How many times, and all of you would raise your hands if we were doing a show of hands. Were you angry about something, and then someone finally got you calm for a moment, explained the situation, and you realized what? The anger was completely non-justified. You, you didn't know the situation. And so the anger, and we say, well, well as long as it's taken care of now. You know, we try to cover our complete idiocy in the moment that we were angry at something that made no sense. And so people tried to come on and go, this makes no sense. But will we listen? No, because we won't be quick to listen, to listen, to hear what others are saying, our mouths shut. And very often, anger would go away. So if you're going to hear God's word patiently, this is where the battle is. But I would suggest this is where the battle is in your life in every relationship. God wants to speak to you. Are you quick to hear, slow to speak back to him, and slow to anger, especially if God is pressing on some things in your life? Believe me, through James, God is going to press on some things in your life. Don't get mad at him. Receive it. But also in your relationships in this world, these verses are helpful if you're going to live according to God's word. Secondly, receive God's word humbly. Receive God's word humbly. So hear it, now receive it. Verse 21, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. And I couldn't even, I'm like, what was going on in these churches James is writing to? I mean, our churches clearly are much better than these churches because James would never tell us to put away, I mean, filthiness and rampant wickedness. I mean, this is literal filth, dirt is what he's saying impurity, uncleanness, and rampant wickedness. So if you're going to receive, this is the preparation. I'm going to give you four words. Preparation is the first. If you have surgery, some of you have had surgery recently. Is it just, oh, just show up at 6 a.m. and we'll get started. What do they generally want you to do before you arrive for surgery? There's stuff you have to do when? Before you ever walk through that door. Have you had anything to eat or drink in the last 12 hours? Or did you drink what we told you to drink and gave you this stuff or take this or do that? They do this. They want to prepare you. Why? Because they want to prepare you for whatever is going to happen. And God is saying, so that's in the physical world. I'm going to do surgery physically on your body. And God says, spiritually, pull over the analogy. I want to do surgery spiritually on your soul. You've got to be preparing your soul for the surgery by removing the filthiness and rampant wickedness. You're preparing yourself for that. It's like if you invited me over for Thanksgiving dinner and I'm sitting in my car and you're like, what's he doing? He said, and I walk in and go, man, I was just sitting in my car eating two dozen Krispy Kreme donuts before I walk in. How's my appetite going to be? Depends, I guess, how much I can. <laughs> Let me just say my capacity would not be beyond that. So you've made this feast for me, but I've stuffed myself out in the car before I walked into your house. You can't live in the world of the filth of the world and the uncleanness and then, oh, I can't wait to go read my Bible. There's a brokenness there, right? He's saying you've got to receive the implanted word. You've got to, you guys are filling yourself up with worldly stuff and sin. You've got to get rid of that. This is 1 Peter 3. Indeed, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, the very next book. I have to run that through my mind. You see in uh, 1 Peter chapter uh, 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, so put away all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by you may grow up into salvation. James is saying the same thing. You, you want to know why you're struggling with an appetite for the word of God? Because you're gorging yourself in the world with filthiness and uncleanness. And you'll never have the appetite if you don't get rid of that to prepare yourself. Because it's a serious barrier between you and a passion 
for hearing and comprehending the word of God. Wickedness. This is just moral evil. I can't sit and stare at the internet and the filth that is on the internet and expect my soul to then long for the pure word of God, right? You can't do that. Which is why James says what he does. You have preparatory work to be done in your heart before you truly will receive the word of God. Well, what's the attitude that has to be there? Not just preparation, but attitude. Receive with meekness. With meekness. With a heart of humility. Meaning I'm teachable. I I, want to change. I want to be different. I, I come understanding I'm a broken man. You're a broken person. And coming to the The word of God saying, Lord, will you teach me? Because I mess everything up apart from you. And if you don't have that conviction on your heart, you will never hear the word of God as you should. You receive it with meekness. I know I'm wrong in my theology. I wish I I come to it and say, Lord, teach me. Help me to put this verse with your other scripture that I've studied in order to receive with meekness the transforming power. You know, it's funny, if someone is a plastic surgeon, what do they need people to do in order to walk into their office? They must realize what? Something needs to be changed, right? That wasn't meant to be hard. A lot of you look really good. Plastic surgeon, you know, they do, people get in accidents and everything. Plastic surgeons try to make them look better, the things work better. But you got to realize something's wrong. And so often we come to the Bible just to check off our reading rather than realizing that something's desperately wrong. Not just back then, something's desperately still wrong in my life right now. So with an attitude of meekness, what am I to receive? The object. What does it say? So not just preparation, attitude, but also the object. What's the object? The implanted word. The implanted word. Oh, this is so good. The implanted word. This is the seed analogy. So the same word of truth, verse 18, that caused you to be born again. I mean, this takes you back to what Jesus said, right? A a sower goes out with seed, throws it on the hard, the, the different soils that is there. That's exactly what James is using here. The implanted word has come into your heart. What's it producing? This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the message of salvation. This is repentance and faith in him and all that he's done. Receive that implanted word, which is the word of truth, which has brought you forth, brought brought, uh, life to you. Receive this implanted word. That's what you are to receive, which is what? The word of God. It is the word of God. You must be convinced of this, ladies and gentlemen, this morning. This is the word of God. There is no word of God outside of this. If there was anything else necessary for your life and salvation and godliness, God would have put it where? In the book. There's a conviction there for me. Because that when people said, oh, why didn't God tell us more about this? He didn't want us to know more about that. Because had he wanted us to know more about that, what would he have done? Put it in the manual. He doesn't need for you to know everything. You have eternity with him. He needs you to know how he has worked in the past, present, and will work in the future. His promises to do what? To save you, grow you in godliness, and bring you to his eternal home where you will just experience the logos of God. That's why the implanted word is this book. This is what, know this book This is what's on the final. This is what's on the final. Nothing outside of this is on the final. So the object is the implanted word that we believe that God has brought to us. And what's the result of this? Receive with, which is able to do what? Save your souls. It's able, it refers back to the initial salvation in which the word of God brought the truth of the gospel to an unsaved heart and brought life to that heart. It saved us from the penalty of sin in the moment. 
It is also able to save us by being a constant resource in our heart to save us each and every day. Because you were saved, you are saved, and you are being saved. And ultimately, one day what? This word will save you. Looking forward, that the Spirit of God that has transformed you and is within you is driving you to this book to one day bring you to a final salvation, to a final salvation when you will stand before God completely blameless that the word of God has brought you to that point and the power of the spirit of God through the word of God one day that when we're doing your funeral here one day we can with confidence say boy the word brought them into his eternal kingdom you will be glorified with Christ forever and you will be forever separated from the very presence of sin in your life. This is salvation that is comprehensive. It's able to save your souls. It is the divine power behind the truth of Scripture that is able to initiate salvation, keep it alive and growing, and finally bring it to final glory, completed and perfect. And it's all through the Word of God. It's through the Word of God but we have to hear it and we have to receive it. How do you know you're hearing it and you're receiving it? Well, that's for next week because then you'll do it. If you're hearing it and receiving it and not doing it, guess what? I'll give you a little glimpse. You're not hearing it and receiving it if you're not doing it. That's how it works together. Let us pray together. Our Father, we would ask, Lord, and I'll be the first to confess that our appetite for your word is not what it should be. We've been in our souls eating the Krispy Kreme donuts of this world and starving ourselves from the meat that you long to give us through the word of God. We are finding satisfaction we are finding peace in the things that are in this world rather than hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That we would know your word and be careful to do all that is in it. That we would meditate upon it day and night. That it would be our passion. That's what James wants as we encounter various trials. That in the encountering of various trials, that we would have the word of God to be our guide, that the word of God would be that which would teach us and instruct us in the midst of the war that is going on in our souls. We have the anchor of the Bible, which tells us what to do, how to feel, where to go, your will. It reveals all that to us, but we need to know it. Lord, I pray for all of us here. May you exponentially increase our affections for you, which will then be evident as we seek to know you and what you've written. Oh, you're so good to us, Lord. Thank you for giving us the Bible. You were under no obligation, but you inspired it. You brought, us, you brought it until today, such that all of us sitting here have it within our grasp. But now, Lord, help us to take it in and digest it and to be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. For the glory of Christ, we pray this. Amen.